The Aloe by Lawrence Hope Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist My life was like an aloe flower beneath an orient sky. Your sunshine touched it for an hour, it blossomed but to die. Torn up, cast out, on rubbish heaps where red flames work their will, each atom of the aloe keeps the flower time fragrant still. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Alone by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp From childhood's hour I have not been as others were, I have not seen as others saw, I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source I have not taken my sorrow, I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life, was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which binds me still, from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm, and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brian of Brittany by James Elroy Flecker Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Roses are golden or white or red, and green or gray for a sea, but the loveliest girl alive, men said, was Brian of Brittany. Court or courtier never a one had Brian, the farmer's lass. Her glorious hair was spread in the sun, and her feet were dewed in the grass. Evening opened a flower in the skies and shut the others asleep. Home she came with a west in her eyes, driving her silver sheep. O oh, mother, say, and brothers seven, what guests are these we have, with beards as white as the snow of heaven, and their dark faces grave? But are they merchants from the towns, or captains from the sea, these that are clothed in crimson gowns, and bow the earth to me? Oh, kiss me, Brian, and take the ring. Kiss me good-bye, my daughter. You're to marry a crowned king in Babylon over the water. Golden hair as the gold of a rose had Brian of Brittany, and her breasts were white as the foam, and the light of her eyes was the light of the sea. What shall I do in Babylon, a crowned king to keep? I'll not leave you and my brother John and my flock of silver sheep. Ah, Brian, bravely spoken, and bravely, dear, you speak, not to leave me heart-broken and mother old and weak. Said James, the eldest brother, with his deep black eyes ablaze, They bring us gold, O mother, and jewels with red rays. And John, the youngest brother, whose eyes were bright and blue, said, Let her go, my mother, I'll bring her back to you. Swear by Christ's love, then, my son John, that when I feel the pain, you'll go to leafy Babylon and bring her back again. By Christ upon the cross who bled, and the seventy saints of Rome, I'll go there living or go there dead, and bring my sister home. It fell the mother had not seen a second Whitsuntide since Brian sailed a Persian queen, when her seven sons all died. O oh, false and faithless, my son John, and traitor in your tomb, who will now go to Babylon and bring me Brian home, whose hair is the golden gold of a rose, and red rose lips has she, and her breasts are as white as the foam, and the light of her eyes is the light of the sea. It chanced a summer night so fair 
a night so fair and calm, Brian was combing her beautiful hair in the moon beneath a palm, and gently sounded through the skies slow bells of Babylon, when there came one with bright blue eyes and the face of her brother John. Brian, away from Babylon, our mother weeps to-night. How tall you are, my brother John, and your blue eyes, how bright! Oh, I am tall enough to stand and eyed enough to see, and we'll go round by way of the land from here to Brittany. Days went on, and the road went on, and skies brought paler skies. You never sleep, my brother John, you never close your eyes. O oh, Brian, sister, do not fear, and Brian, do not weep. Before I came to find you, dear, I had enough of sleep. Days went on, and the road went on, and stars to pale or shine. You never eat, my brother John, nor drink a drop of wine. Fear not, dear girl, though long our road, so great a strength is mine, for I have eaten holy food and drunk a scented wine. A month and a year and a day had gone, they came to a sweet country, oh, the silver shades of the forest glades of Brian's Brittany. And the little birds began to talk in voices faintly human. Who ever saw a dead man walk beside a rosy woman? Oh, brother, listen to the birds chattering all together. The talk of the birds is feather words and lighter than a feather. Open, mother, to your son John, and open to your daughter. I bring you Brian from Babylon, from Babylon over the water. And her hair is the golden gold of a rose, and her lips as the red rose tree, and her breasts are as white as the foam, and the light of her eyes is the light of the sea. But I must back and over the hill, and Brian must over the sea, and you, old mother, who sit quite still, must over the hill with me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Copernicus by Alfred Noyes. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The neighbors gossiped idly at the door. Copernicus lay dying overhead. His little throng of friends, with startled eyes, whispered together in that dark house of dreams, from which, by one dim crevice in the wall, he used to watch the stars. His book has come from Nuremberg at last, but who would dare to let him see it now? They have altered it. Though Rome approved in full this preface, Look declares that his discoveries are a dream. He has asked a thousand times if it has come. Could we tear out those pages? He'd suspect. What shall be done, then? Hold it back a while. That was the priest's voice in the room above. He may forget it. Those last sacraments may set his mind at rest and bring him peace. Then, stealing quietly to that upper door, they opened it a little, and saw within the lean white deathbed of Copernicus, who made our world a world without an end. There, in that narrow room, they saw his face, gray, seamed with thought, lit by a single lamp. They saw those glorious eyes closing, that once had looked beyond the spheres, and seen our ancient firmaments dissolve into a boundless night, Beside him knelt two women like bowed shadows. At his feet an old physician watched him. At his head the cowled Franciscan murmured, while the light shone faintly on the chalice. All grew still. The fragrance of the vine was like faint flowers, the first breath of those far celestial fields. Then, like a dying soldier that must leave, his last command to others, while the fight is yet uncertain and the victory far. Copernicus whispered in a fevered dream, Yes, it is death, but you must hold him back, there in the doorway, for a little while, until I know the work is rightly done. Use all your weapons, doctor. I must live to see and touch one copy of my book. Have they not brought it yet? They promised me it should be here by nightfall. One of you go and hasten it. I, 
I can hold back death till dawn. Have they not brought it yet from Nuremberg? Do not deceive me, I must know it's safe. Printed and safe for other men to use. I could die then. My use would be fulfilled. What has delayed them? Will not someone go and tell them that my strength is running out? Tell them that book would be an angel's hand in mine, an easier pillow for my head, a little lantern in the engulfing dark. You see, I hid its struggling light so long under too small a bushel that I fear it may go out forever. In the noon of life's brief day I could not see the need, as now I see it. When the night shuts down, I was afraid. Perhaps it might confuse the lights that guide us for the souls of men. Uh, but now I see three stages in our life. At first we bask contented in our sun, and take what daylight shows us for the truth. When we discover in some midnight grief how all day long the sunlight blinded us to depths beyond, where all our knowledge dies, that's where men shrink and lose their way in doubt. Then at last, as death draws near, comes a night in whose majestic shadow men see God, absolute knowledge reconciling all. So all my life I pondered on that scheme which makes this earth the center of all worlds lighted and wheeled around by sun and moon, and that great crystal sphere wherein men thought myriads of lesser stars were fixed like lamps, each in its place, one mighty glittering wheel revolving round this dark abode of man. Night after night, with even pace they moved, year after year, not altering by one point their order, or their stations, those fixed stars in that revolving firmament. The plows still pointed to the pole, fixed in their sphere. How else explain that vast unchanging wheel? How but by thinking all those lesser lights were huger suns divided from our earth, by so immense a gulf that if they moved ten thousand leagues an hour among themselves, it would not seem one hair's breadth in our eyes utterly inconceivable i know and yet we daily kneel to boundless power and build our hope on that infinitude this did not daunt me then indeed i saw light upon chaos many discordant dreams began to move in lucid music now for what could be more baffling than the thought that those enormous heavens must circle earth diurnally a journey that would need swiftness to which the lightning flash would seem a white slug creeping on the walls of the night while if earth softly on her axle spun one quiet revolution answered all it was our moving selves that made the sky seem to revolve have not all ages seen a like illusion baffling half mankind in life thought art men think at every turn of their own souls the very heavens have moved light upon chaos light and yet more light for as i watched the planets venus mars appear to wax and wane from month to month as though they moved now near now far from earth earth could not be their center was the sun their sovereign lord then as pythagoras held was this great earth so established, so secure, a planet also? Did it also move around the sun? If this were true, my friends, no revolution in this world's affairs, not the blind maelstrom where imperial Rome went down into the dark, could so engulf all that we thought we knew. We who believed in our own majesty, we who walked with gods, as younger sons on this proud central stage, round which the whole bright firmament revolved, for our especial glory, 
must we creep like ants upon our midget ball of dust lost in immensity i could not take that darkness lightly i withheld my book for many a year until i clearly saw and rome approved me have they not brought it yet that this tremendous music could not drown the still supernal music of the soul or quench the light that shone when christ was born for who if one lost star could lead the kings to god's own son would shrink from following these to his eternal throne this at the least we know the soul of man can soar through heaven it is our own wild wings that dwarf the world to nothingness beneath us let the soul take courage then if its own thoughts be true not all the immensities of little minds can ever quench its own celestial fire no this new light was needed that the soul might conquer its own kingdom and arise to its full stature so in the face of death i saw that i must speak the truth i knew have they not brought it what delays my book i am afraid tell me the truth my friends at this last hour the church may yet withhold her sanction not the church but those who think a little darkness helps her were this true they would do well if the poor light we win confuse or blind us to the light of lights let all our wisdom perish i affirm a greater darkness where the one true church shall after all her agonies of loss and many an age of doubt perhaps to come see this processional host of splendors burn like tapers round her altar so i speak not for myself but for the age unborn i caught the fire from those who went before the bearers of the torch who could not see the goal to which they strained i caught their fire and carried it only a little way beyond but there are those who wait for it i know those who will carry it on to victory i dare not fail them looking back i see those others fallen with their arms outstretched dead pointing to the future far far back before the egyptians built their pyramids with those dark funnels pointing to the north through which the pharaohs from their desert tombs gaze all night long upon the polar star some wandering arab crept from death to life led by the plough across those wastes of pearl long long ago have they not brought it yet my book i finished it one summer's night and felt my blood all beating into song i meant to print those verses in my book a prelude hinting at that deeper night which darkens all our knowledge then i thought the measure moved too lightly do you recall those verses elsa they would pass the time how happy i was the night i wrote that song then one of those bowed shadows raised her head and like a mother crooning to her child murmured the words he wrote so long ago in old cathay in old cathay before the western world began they saw the moving fount of day eclipsed as by a shadowy fan they stood upon their chinese wall they saw his fire to ashes fade and felt the deeper slumber fall on domes of pearl and towers of jade with slim brown hands and araby they traced upon the desert sand their rams and scorpions of the sky they strove and failed to understand before their footprints were effaced the shifting sand forgot their room their hieroglyphs were all erased their desert naked to the moon in baghdad of the purple nights harun al rashid built a tower where sages watched a thousand lights and read their legends for an hour the tower is down the caliph dead their astrolabes are wrecked with rust orion glitters overhead aladdin's lamp is in the dust in babylon in babylon they baked their tablets of the clay 
and year by year inscribed thereon the dark eclipses of their day they saw the moving finger write its many many on their sun a mightier shadow cloaks their light and clay is clay in babylon a shadow moved towards him from the door copernicus with a cry upraised his head the book i cannot see it let me feel the lettering on the cover it is here put out the lamp now draw those curtains back ed let me die with starlight on my face an angel's hand in mine yes i can say my nunc dimittis now light and more light in that pure realm whose darkness is our peace end of poem this recording is in the public domain Easter Day Two by Arthur Hugh Clough Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist So in the sinful streets, abstracted and alone, I with my secret self held communing of mine own. So in the southern city spake the tongue of one that somewhat overwildly sung, but in a later hour I sat and heard another voice that spake, another, graver word. Weep not, it bade, whatever hath been said. Though he be dead, he is not dead. In the true creed he is yet risen indeed. Christ is yet risen. Weep not beside his tomb, ye women unto whom. He was great comfort and yet greater grief. Nor ye, ye faithful few that want with him to roam, Seek sadly what for him ye left, go hopeless to your home. Nor ye despair, ye share as yet to be of their belief. Though he be dead, he is not dead, not gone, though fled, not lost, though vanished. Though he return not, though he lies and moulders low, in the true creed he is yet risen indeed. Christ is yet risen. Sit if ye will, sit down upon the ground, yet not to weep and wail, but calmly look around. Whate'er befell, earth is not hell. Now, too, as when it first began, life is yet life, and man is man. For all that breathe beneath the heaven's high cope, joy with grief mixes, with despondence, hope. Hope conquers cowardice, joy grief, or at least faith unbelief. Though dead, not dead, not gone, though fled, not lost, though vanished, in the great gospel and true creed, he is yet risen indeed. Christ is yet risen. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fiddler Jones by Edgar Lee Masters Recorded for LibriVox by William George Fiddler Jones the earth keeps some vibration going there in your heart, and that is you. And if the people find you can fiddle, why, fiddle you must for all your life. What do you see? A harvest of clover? Or a meadow to walk through to the river? The winds in the corn? You rub your hands for beeves hereafter ready for market. Or else... You hear the rustle of skirts like the girls when dancing at Little Grove. To Cooney Potter, a pillar of dust or whirling leaves meant ruinous drought. They looked to me like redhead Sammy stepping it off to Touralure. How could I till my forty acres, not to speak of getting more, with a medley of horns, bassoons, and piccolos stirred in my brain by crows and robins and the creak of a windmill only these and i never started to plow in my life that someone did not stop in the road and take me away to a dance or picnic i ended up with 40 acres i ended up with a broken fiddle and a broken laugh and a thousand memories and not a single regret. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Go, Lovely Rose by Edmund Waller Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Go, lovely rose, tell her that wastes her time and me, that now she knows when I resemble her to thee how sweet and fair she seems to be. Tell her that's young and shuns to have her graces spied, that hadst thou sprung in deserts where no men abide, thou must have uncommended died. Small is the worth of beauty from the light retired. Bid her come forth, suffer herself to be desired, and not blush so to be admired. Then die, that she, the common fate of all things rare, may read in thee how small a part of time they share that are so wondrous, sweet, and fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is the House That Jack Built by Randolph Caldecott Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf This is the house that Jack built. This is the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the cat that killed the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the dog that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the cow with the crumpled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with the crumpled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the man all tattered and torn, that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with the crumpled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the priest all shaven and shorn, that married the man all tattered and torn, that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with the crumpled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the cock that crowed in the morn, that waked the priest all shaven and shorn, that married the man all tattered and torn, that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with a crumpled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the farmer, sowing his corn, that kept the cock that crowed in the morn, that waked the priest all shaven and shorn, that married the man all tattered and torn, that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with a crumpled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. How the Leaves Came Down by Susan Coolidge, read for LibriVox.org by Rachel. I'll tell you how the leaves came down, the great tree to his children said, You're getting sleepy, yellow and brown, yes, very sleepy, little red, it is quite time you went to bed. Ah, begged each silly pouting leaf, let us a little longer may, dear father tree, behold our grief, tis such a very pleasant day. We do not want to go away. So just for one more merry day, To the great tree the leaflets clung, Frolicked and danced and had their way. Upon the autumn breezes swung, Whispering all their sports among. Perhaps the great tree will forget, And let us stay until the spring, If we all beg and coax and fret. But the great tree did no such thing, He smiled to hear their whispering. Come, children, all to bed, he cried, and ere the leaves could urge their prayer, he shook his head, and far and wide, fluttering and rustling everywhere, down sped the leaflets through the air. I saw them, on the ground they lay, 
golden and red a huddled swarm waiting till one from far away white bedclothes heaped upon her arm should come to wrap them safe and warm the great bare tree looked down and smiled good night dear little leaves he said and from below each sleepy child replied good night and murmured it's so nice to go to bed end of poem this recording is in the public domain in possum land by henry lawson read for riverfox.org by glen o'brien www.glenobrien.net in possum land the nights are fair the streams are fresh and queer no dust is in the moon with hair no cherry charts the ear with possums scrubbing overhead neath western stars so grand Ah, would that we could break our bed tonight in possum land. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 2 from Four Sonnets I Think I Should Have Loved You Presently by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira Searle March 2015 I think I should have loved you presently And given in earnest words I flung in jest And lifted honest eyes for you to see And caught your hand against my cheek and breast and all my pretty follies flung aside that won you to me, And beneath your gaze, naked of reticence and shorn of pride, Spread like a chart my little wicked ways. I that had been to you, had you remained, But one more waking from a recurrent dream, Cherish no less the certain stakes I gained, And walk your memory's halls, austere, supreme, A ghost in marble of a girl you knew, Who would have loved you in a day or two. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A joyful meditation to all England of the coronation of our most natural sovereign lord, King Henry the Eighth. A poem by Stephen Hawes. Read for LibriVox by Patricia Booth. The Prologue. The prudent problems and the noble works of the genteel poets in old antiquity, and to this day hath made famous clerks, for the poets wrote nothing in vanity but grounded them on good morality, and sensing out the fair dulcet fume, our language rude to exile and consume. The right eloquent poet and monk of Bury made many fair books, as it is probable, from idle darkness to light our hemisphere, whose virtuous pastime was much commendable, presenting his books, greatly profitable, to your worthy predecessor, the fifth King Henry, which registered is in the court of memory. Amidst the meadow of Flora, the queen of the gods, Elysian is the spring or well, and by it groweth a fair laurel green, of which the poets do off write and tell. Beside this olive I did never dwell, to taste the water which is aromatic, for to cause me right with lusty rhetoric. Wherefore, good sovereign, I beseech your highness to pardon me which do rudely endite, as in this art having small interest, but for to learn is all mine appetite. In following the monk which did nobly write, beseeching your highness and grace debonair for to accept this rude and little choir. Explicit Prologus O God alone in heaven wearing crown, 
in whose inspect is every regal sea, both to enhance and for to cast her down, such is the power of thy high majesty. Neither hardiness, treason, nor dignity may withstand thy strength, which is in every place so great and mighty is thy divine grace. Two titles in one thou didst well unify, when the red rose took the white in marriage, reigning together right high and nobly, from whose united titles and worthy lineage descended is, by right excellent courage, King Henry the Eighth, for to reign, doubtless, universal his fame, honour and largesse which hath espoused a fair flower of virtue, descended of kings, Dame Catherine of Spain. Here there is a missing line. By grace and prudence the peace to attain. Wherefore, England, thou needst not complain, since thou hast crowned openly in sight this king and queen by good true love and right. But what should I show by perambulation all this great triumph for which report is made about now in every nation, and to all this realm to be joy and comfort. Wherefore, you lords, I humbly you exhort, spiritual and temporal, with the commons unified, to give God the praise which doth grace provide. England, be glad. The dew of grace is spread, the dew of joy, the dew wholesome and suit, Distilled is now from the rose so red and of the white, so springing from the root, after our trouble to be refute and boot. This royal tree was planted, as I know, by God above, the rancour to down throw. Who is the flower that doth this grace distill? But only Henry, the eighth king of his name, with golden drops all England to fulfil, to show his largesse, his honour and his fame. His deeds thereto exemplify the fame, wherefore now England, with whole devotion, for this young king make daily orison. Our late sovereign, his father excellent, I know right well some hold opinion, that to avarice he had intendiment, gathering great riches of this his region. But they little know, by their small reason, for what high intent he gathered, doubtless unto his grace such innumerable riches. For I think well and God had sent him life, as they have marvelled much of this gathering, so it to them should have been affirmative. To have had great wonder of his spending, it may fortune he thought to have moving of mortal war, our faith to stabilise against the Turks, their power to minish. But since that death by his course natural hath him arrested, and would not delay, likewise as he was, so we be mortal. How, where, or when, I can nothing say. Therefore to God above let us all pray, for to grant him mercy which was our king bringing his soul to joy everlasting. Ah, fair England, mistrust thee right naught, regard right well his son's justice, see how that they which innuentions sought, delighting them in the sin of avarice, to oppress the commons by great prejudice, doth he not punish them according to law, such new promotions to dampen and withdraw. Saturn Fie on thee, Saturn, with thy misty fume, replete with fraud, treason, and wickedness, to show thy beams thou darest not presume. So cursed thou art, without unstableness, devoid of grace, fulfilled with doubleness. Thy power to England was never amiable, but always evil, untrue, and variable. Jupiter, now genteel Jupiter, the lodestone of light, Thy steadfast beams, so fair and so clear, cast now abroad that we may have a sight to gladden us all when that they do appear, sending down truth from thy effulgent sphere, for to make our hearts meekly to incline to serve our sovereign which doth now domine. 
Mars. O mighty Mars, O God of the war, O flaming honour of every hardy heart, send down thy power truly from so far, as to encourage that we do not start, but by hardiness that we may subvert our sovereign's enemies, to him contrarious by battle's fire rightful and rigorous. Phoebus And thou, fair, bright, and aureate Phoebus, increase now light with love and honour, among the lords so gay and glorious, with thy radiant beams so high of favour, devoiding all treachery, debate, and rancour, and illumine the mind with liberality of our good sovereign, with wealth and unity. Venus And Lady Venus, with thy son Cupid, of every lord do now the heart inspire, with fervent love, that he do not slide, and of the commons set the heart on fire, to love our sovereign with their whole desire, following his grace with dulcet harmony, to the rightful way without and jeopardy. Mercury Also thou Mercury, the god of eloquence, the genteel star of grace and virtue, thy beams of right peace and conscience on our king's counsel down send, and renew the truth of justice that they may eschew for to do wrong by the sin of covetous that herebefore hath done great prejudice. Luna And thou, watery doyen of the sea, the goddess, with thy broader Aeolus, the god of the wind, encourage the hearts by inward hardiness. Here is a missing line. And enemies rise that they be not behind, them for to chase, and the sea to scour, by grace and fortune in many a stormy stour. O God above, thronized in heaven, in whose will resteth everything alone, the sky, the earth, with all the planets seven, without whose grace comfort we have none. As thou art three enclosed in one, so save our sovereign from all manner of woe, and this his realm from mortal war also. Holy Church, rejoice with all your liberties, without an damage, the king will ye increase, and be your shield from all adversities, no wrong shall be, but he will it soon cease, knitting the knot of faith, love and peace between you and him, without disturbance, so for to endure by long continuance. Right mighty Prince, our good Sovereign Lord, to God inclining, be hardy and glad. Of you and your realm he will see concord, though other nations be therefore full sad against you murmuring with their works bad. Yet dread ye nothing, for God with his might will be always ready to defend the right. Right noble, wise and excellent princess, right benign lady, liberal and virtuous, descended linearly of the line of nobleness, fair Queen Catherine, so sweet and precious, to our sovereign espoused with joy salacious, almighty God give grace to multiply from you your stores to reign right royally. And Lady Mary, princess right beauteous, endued with honour, virtue and prudence, right meek, goodly, Genteel and gracious, sister right dear unto the excellence of our good sovereign, surmounting in sapience, right fair young lady, the great Lord above, he grant you grace, high fame, fortune and love. And all you lords and ladies honourable, and you noble knights so haunting chivalry, unto our sovereign be meek and tenderable, which will reward you well and nobly, as to show his largesse universally, encouraging your hearts that courage chivalrous in time of battle for to be victorious. And all ye officers of every degree, beware extortion, for an it be known, no doubt it is, but ye shall punished be. 
take heed of them, the which be overthrown. Remember well how fortune hath he blown, the promoters down, and casting them full low, in following them ye shall fall as I trow. England, be true, and love well each other. Obey your sovereign, and God omnipotent, which is above, of all the world the rudder, will send you wealth from whom all good is sent. He gives us grace to keep his commandment, and save our sovereign with his seemly queen, with all their blood, without trouble and teen. Amen. Excusatio Octoris Go, little treaties, submit thee humbly to our sovereign lord, to be in his presence, beseeching his grace to accept thee meekly, and to pardon thy rudeness and negligence. Here there is another line missing. To compile those matters which should pleasure be unto his highness and regal majesty. Now ye fair ladies, wise and virtuous, I right humbly pray you for to condescend to accept my making, nothing for Cundius I would, that fortune would cunning extend, that mine inditing I might then amend, to direct my matters after your pleasance, which yet replete am with all ignorance. Amen. Thus endeth this joyful meditation made and compiled by Stephen Hawes, sometime groom of the chamber of our late Sovereign Lord, King Henry the Seventh, Imprinted at London, in the Fleet Street, at the sign of the sun, by Winkin de Word. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. March Evening by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira Searle March 2015 Blue through the window burns the twilight Heavy through trees blows the warm south wind Glistening against the chill grey skylight Wet black branches are barred and entwined. Sodden and spongy, the scarce green grass plot dents into pools where a foot has been. Puddles lie spilt in the road, a mass not of water but steel with its cold hard sheen. Faint fades the fire on the hearth, its embers scattering wide at a stronger gust. Above, the old weathercock groans, but remembers creaking to turn in its centuried rust. Dying, forlorn in dreary sorrow, wrapping the mists round her withering form, day sinks down, and in darkness Tomorrow travails to birth in the womb of the storm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Morning Rains by Michael Field. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. I heard a morning thrush salute the rains that beat in soft, prolific rush, armies of angry dewdrops on the panes in shower across the roofs. The thrush, through all this liquid measure, sang shrilly for his pleasure, and, as the soft and shrill together mingled, my ears voluptuously tingled. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Old Master by C. J. Dennis Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles An Old Master We were carting lathes and palings from the slopes of Mount St. Leonard With our axles near the roadbed and the mud as stiff as glue And our bullocks weren't precisely what you'd call conditioned nicely 
and me and messmate Mitchell had our doubts of getting through. It had rained a tidy skyful in the week before we started, but our tucker bag depended on the selling of our load, so we punched em on by inches, lifting em across the pinches, till we struck the final section of the worst part of the road. We were just congratulating one another on the going when we blundered in a pothole right within the sight of goal, where the bush track joins the metal, Mitchell, as he saw us settle, justified his reputation at the peril of his soul. We were in a glue pot certain, red and stiff and most tenacious, over knaves and over axles, wagons sitting on the road. Struth, says I, they'll never lift her, take a shot from hell to shift her, Nothing left us but unyoke em and sling off the blessed load. Now beside our scene of trouble stood a little one-roomed humpy, home of an enfeebled party by the name of Dad McGee. Daddy was, I pause to mention, living on an old-age pension, since he gave up bullock-punching at the age of eighty-three. Startled by our exclamations, Daddy hobbled from the shanty, gazing where the stranded wagon looked like some half-founded ship when the state of things he spotted looks he says like you was potted and he toddles up to mitchell here he says give me that whip well i've heard of transformations heard of fellows sort of changing in the face of sudden danger or some great emergency heard the like in song and story and in bush traditions hoary but I nearly dropped me bundle as I looked at Dad McGee. While we gazed, he seemed to toughen as his fingers gripped the handle. His old form grew straight and supple, and a light leapt in his eye. And he stepped around the wagon, not with footsteps weak and lagging, but with firm, determined bearing as he flung the whip on high. Now he swung the leaders over while the whiplash snarled and volleyed, and they answered like one bullock, straining to each crack and clout but he kept his cursing under till old brindle made a blunder then i thought all hell had hit me and the master opened out and the language oh the language seemed to me i must be dreaming while the wondrous words and phrases only genius could produce roared and rumbled fast and faster in the throat of that old master oaths and curses tipped with lightning crackling flames of fierce abuse. Then we knew the man before us was a master of our calling, one of those great lords of language gone forever from out back, heroes of an ancient order, men who punched across the border, vanished giants of the sixties, puncher princes of the track. Now we heard the timbers straining, heard the wagons loud complaining, and the master cried triumphant as he swung em in the line as they put their shoulders to it, lifted her and pulled her through it. That's the way we used to do it in the days of 69. Near the foot of Mount St. Leonard lives an old enfeebled party who retired from bullock punching at the age of 83. If you seek him, folk will mention merely that he draws the pension, but to us he looms a master prince of punches, Dad McGee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rules and Regulations by Lewis Carroll read for LibriVox.org by Olga Bulova. A short direction to avoid dejection by variations in occupations and prolongation of relaxation and combinations of recreations and disputation on the state of the nation in adaptation to your station by invitations to friends and relations, by evitation of amputation, by permutation in conversation, and deep reflection, you'll avoid ejection. Learn well your grammar, and never stammer, write well and neatly, and sing most sweetly. Be enterprising, love early rising, go walk of six miles, have ready quick smiles, with lightsome laughter, soft flowing after. Drink tea, not coffee, never eat toffee, eat bread with butter, once more don't stutter. Don't waste your money, abstain from honey, shut doors behind you, don't slam them, mind you. Drink beer, not porter, don't enter the water till to swim you are able. Sit close to the table, take care of a candle, shut a door by the handle, don't push with your shoulder until you are older. 
Lose not a button, refuse cold mutton, starve your canaries, believe in fairies, if you are able, don't have a stable with any manders, be rude to strangers, morale, behave. The end of the poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sea and the Skylark by Gerard Manley Hopkins Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk On ear and ear, two noises, too old to end. Trench right, the tide that ramps against the shore. With a flood or a fall, low lull off or all roar. Frequenting there while moon shall wear and wend. Left hand, off land, I hear the lark ascend. His rash, fresh, rewinded, new skeined score. In crisps of curl, off wild winch whirl. And pour and pelt music till none's to spill nor spend. How these two shame this shallow and frail town. How ring right out our sordid, turbid time, being pure. We, life's pride and cared-for crown, have lost that cheer and charm of earth's past prime. Our make and making break are breaking down to man's last dust, drain fast towards man's first slime. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Smokey the Bear Sutra by Gary Snyder Read for LibriVox.org by Ed Humpel and Eileen Tipping Once in the Jurassic, about 150 million years ago, the great sun Buddha in this corner of the infinite void gave a discourse to all the assembled elements and energies, to the standing beings, the walking beings, the flying beings, and the sitting beings, even grasses, to the number of thirteen billions, each one born from a seed, assembled there, a discourse concerning enlightenment on the planet Earth. In some future time there will be a continent called America, it will have great centers of power called such as Pyramid Lake, Walden Pond, Mount Rainier, Big Sur, Everglades, and so forth, and powerful nerves and channels such as Columbia River, Mississippi River, and Grand Canyon. The human race in that era will get into troubles all over its head and practically wreck everything in spite of its own strong, intelligent Buddha nature. The twisting strata of the great mountains and the pulsings of volcanoes are my love burning deep in the earth. My obstinate compassion is schist and basalt and granite, to be mountains, to bring down the rain. In that future American era I shall enter a new form, to cure the world of loveless knowledge that seeks with blind hunger and mindless rage, eating food that will not fill it and he showed himself in his true form of Smokey the Bear. A handsome, smoky-colored brown bear standing on his hind legs, showing that he is aroused and watchful, bearing in his right paw the shovel that digs to the truth beneath appearances, cuts the roots of useless attachments, and flings damp sand on the fires of greed and war his left paw in the mudra of comradely display, indicating that all creatures have the right to live to their limits and that deer, rabbits, chipmunks, snakes, dandelions, and lizards all grow in the realm of the Dharma. Wearing the blue work overalls symbolic of slaves and laborers, the countless men oppressed by a civilization that claims to save but often destroys, wearing the broad-brimmed hat of the West, symbolic of the forces that guard the wilderness, which is the natural state of the Dharma and the true path of man on earth. All true paths lead through mountains. With a halo of smoke and flame behind, the forest fires of the Kali Yuga, 
fires caused by the stupidity of those who think things can be gained and lost, whereas in truth all is contained, vast and free, in the blue sky and the green earth of one mind. Round-bellied to show his kind nature, and that the great earth has food enough for everyone who loves her and trusts her. Trampling underfoot wasteful freeways and needless suburbs, smashing the worms of capitalism and totalitarianism. Indicating the task, his followers becoming free of cars, houses, canned foods, universities, and shoes. Mastered the three mysteries of their own body, speech, and mind, and fearlessly chop down the rotten trees and prune out the sick limbs of this country, America, and then burn the leftover trash. Wrathful but calm, austere but comic, Smokey the Bear will illuminate those who would help him. But for those who would hinder or slander him, he will put them out. Thus his great mantra. Nama Samanta Vajranam Chanda Maharoshana Svataya Hum Traka Ham Nam I dedicate myself to the universal diamond. Be this raging fury destroyed. And he will protect those who love woods and rivers, gods and animals, hobos and madmen, prisoners and sick people, musicians, playful women and hopeful children. And if anyone is threatened by advertising, air pollution, television, or the police, they should chant Smokey the Bear's war spell. Drown, drown their, their butts, butts, crush their butts, butts drown their, their butts, butts, crush their butts. And Smokey the Bear will surely appear to put the enemy out with his Vajra shovel. Now those who recite this sutra, then try to put it in practice, will accumulate merit as countless as the sands of Arizona and Nevada. Will help save the planet Earth from total oil slick. Will enter the age of harmony of man and nature. Will win the tender love and caresses of men, women, and beasts. Will always have ripe blackberries to eat and a sunny spot under a pine tree to sit at. And in the end will win the highest, perfect enlightenment. Thus we have heard, may be reproduced free forever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spring by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Nothing is so beautiful as spring, When weeds in wheels shoot long and lovely and lush, Thrush's eggs look little low heavens, And thrush through the echoing timber Does so rinse and wring the ear, It strikes like lightnings to hear him sing. The glossy pear tree leaves and blooms, They brush the descending blue, that blue is all in a rush with richness. The racing lambs, too, have fair their fling. What is all this juice and all this joy? A strain of the earth's sweet being in the beginning in Eden garden. Have, get, before it cloy, before it cloud, Christ, Lord, and sour with sinning. Innocent mind and mayday in girl and boy. Most, O oh maid's child, thy choice and worthy the winning. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Starlight Night by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Look at the stars, look, look up at the skies. Oh, look at all the fire folk sitting in the air. The bright burrows, the circle citadels there. Down in dim woods, the diamond delves, the elves' eyes, the gray lawns, cold, where gold 
where quick gold lies wind beat white beam area beals set on a flare flake doves sent floating forth at a farmyard scare ah well it is all a purchase all is a prize buy then bid then what prayer patience alms vows look look a may mess like on orchard boughs look march bloom like on mealed with yellow sallows these are indeed the barn within doors house the shocks this peace bright paling shuts the spouse christ home christ and his mother and all his hallows end of poem this recording is in the public domain Untitled by Emily Dickinson. Read for LibriVox.org by Lyra Morris Clark. March 29, 2015. I had been hungry all the years. My noon had come to dine. I trembling drew the table near and touched the curious wine. Twas this on tables I had seen when turning, hungry, lone. I looked in windows for the wealth I could not hope to own. I did not know the ample bread, t'was so unlike the crumb. The birds and I had often shared in nature's dining room. This plenty hurt me, t'was so new, myself felt ill and odd, as berry of a mountain bush transplanted to the road. Nor was I hungry, so I found, that hunger was a way of persons outside windows the entering takes away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Uri by C. J. Dennis. Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles. Uri. Now, Matilda, ain't you dressed yet? I declare the girl ain't up. Last as usual, move yourself, you sleepy head. Are you going to lie there lazing while I. Now, put down that basin. Go and see if Bill has got the potties fed. Tell him not to move that clucky. Ho, oh, you're up, me lady, eh? That's what comes from gallivanting late at night. Why, the sun is nearly... See now, don't you dare talk back at me now. Set the table, Nell. Where's Nell? Put out that light. Now then, hurry, goodness, hurry. Mary, tell the men to come. Oh, there, drat the girl. Matilda, where's the jam? You forgot it? Well, of all the... Mary, hear me tell you call the... Lord, there's Baldy tangled in the barbed wire. Sam! Now then, take a steady, clumsy, or she'll cut herself. Leave off! Do you want the cow to... There, I never did. Well, you might have took a steady. Sit up, Dad, you're late already. Did you put the tea in, Mary? Where's the lid? Oh, do hurry, where's them buckets? Nell, has Bill brought in the cows? Where's that boy? Ain't finished eating yet, of course. Eat all day if he was let to. Mary, where'd your father get to? Gone? What? Call him back, Dad. What about that horse? No, indeed it ain't my business. You can see the man yourself. No, I won't. I'm sure I've quite enough to do. If he calls today about it, he can either go without it, or else walk across the paddock out to you. Are the cows in? Bill! Oh, there you are. Well, nearly time they... Nell, feed the calves and pack the... Yes, indeed you will. Get the separator ready. Whoa there, Baldy. Steady, steady. Bail up, stop. Er, uh, hi, Matilda. Mary, Bill. Well, of all the... Now you've done it. Wait till Dad comes home tonight. When he sees the mess you've... Don't stand staring there. Go and get the cart and Neddy and the cream cans. Are they ready? Where's the... There, forgot the fowls, I do declare. Chook, chook, chook. Well, there's that white one. Lost another chick today. Nell, how many did I cull it? Oh, stop that row. What's he doing, oh, you daisy? Do you mean to tell me, lazy, that you haven't fed the pigs until just now? Oh, do hurry, there's the men'll soon be knocking off for lunch, and we haven't got the... Reach that bacon down. Get the billies, Nell and Mary. Go and fetch the... What? How dare ye? Bill, you're not to wear your best hat into town. 
get up the cans and now go down the paddock with the lunch there's that dog gone off with bill do hurry on you must get to town in fast time or you'll miss the train like last time oh and bill if there's some empties there he's gone now then mary hurry up or ow oh, good god look at that calf take it from him or he'll chew it into bits you'd no right to leave it out there with them calves and things about there heavens what a state dad's best my you'll get fits have you washed the things matilda oh do hurry girl you're late seems to me you trouble more take care you dunce now you've broke it well i never ain't you mighty smart and clever trying to carry half a dozen things at once no back answers now you hussy don't you dare talk back at me or i'll nelly did you give them eggs to bill what you never well i mary bring them dishes from the dairy no not them the lord the sun's behind the hill all right dad all right don't worry now matilda goodness hurry where'd you put that pie that's over what which shelf mary what about the tea things must i always have to see things managed proper can't you tend to it yourself where's that bill what ain't he back yet did you ever see the like dad you'll have to take and talk to that young turk every time he goes to town there he just stays and loafs around there while he leaves us women here to slave and work have you cleaned the separator now well get along to bed no you can't go cross to thompson's place tonight you was there last tuesday see miss don't you toss your head at me miss i won't have it mary hurry with that light now then get your dad the paper sit down dad you must be tired here matilda put that almanac away where's them stockings i was darning bill and mary stop your yarning now then dad hey ho me first sit down today end of poem this recording is in the public domain Wisdom by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira Searle March 2015 It was a night of early spring The winter sleep had scarcely broken Around us shadows and the wind Listened for what was never spoken Though half a score of years are gone, Spring comes as sharply now as then. But if we had it all to do, It would be done the same again. It was a spring that never came, But we have lived enough to know That what we never have remains, It is the things we have that go. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.